Let's wait and let everyone get settled. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Ebal. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Nelson Ebal. I represent Jonathan Avery. May it please the court. Avery pleaded to a terrible crime, knowing he would have a long sentence, but unfortunately the district court failed to follow the federal rules of criminal procedure and the sentencing guidelines when imposing the sentence. This morning, I'm going to begin with talking about the uh, partial absence of factual findings as to the enhancement. To be sure, the district court did describe Mr. Avery's conduct as sinister, exploitation of the worst type, and also identified it as trafficking in women. Although the district court made these findings, the district court failed to make a key finding whether it was actually tied to the offense of conviction. Section 2G1.1B1, the enhancement at issue, it allows a four-level enhancement if the offense involved fraud or coercion. In turn, office, offense is defined broadly uh, to include uh, not just the offense of conviction, but also the accompanying relevant conduct. And relevant conduct in, is in turn defined as all actions that took place during the offense of conviction, in preparation for the offense, and to avoid detection or responsibility. The sinister conduct here where Avery was uh, trying to persuade the victim, coerce the victim to stay in Houston. That was separate from the underlying offense in this case, which was persuading the victim to travel in interstate commerce to Houston to engage in prostitution. But at the first sentencing, the district court said it was coerced prostitution. That is correct. The um, Although it was coerced, prostitution after she was already in Houston, after the crime that uh, Avery pleaded guilty had been completed. Okay, maybe just step back, because we're, we're focused on just a coercion enhancement, correct? That's correct. And the argument you're making is there was evidence coercion, but not as to this charge? That is correct. So it's not, it's not a, a process argument based on Rule 32, or a constitutional argument based on lack of presence, or it is. In other words, what's your argument that you're asking us to reverse the sentencing? It's just a pure evidentiary argument? No, no, well, uh, I've made three arguments okay. in the brief. Uh, the first, this was a, there's an unusual posture here in that um, there was an enhancement, and I mean, there were four points added mm -hmm. at the sentencing, but it just... Well, and, uh, I mean, you had the first sentencing, right. and then it looked like, correct me if I'm wrong, it looked like the district court was thinking, oh, he pled to it. Let's go back and look at the factual basis. But then, the, and that's when you moved to withdrawal, saying, if that's what you think I pled to, I don't want to be on a guilty plea. Right. Second sentence comes, district court says, you're right. Mm -hmm. it, it's not there. But then all that's left is the B enhancement. Mm-hmm. But no discussion was ever had. About but so, okay, that's what I'm wondering. Is that the error, that there was no discussion? Is that your error, or is your argument of error that there isn't evidence at any evidence? Or is it both? It's both. Okay. And you've only presented the evidentiary one so far? That's correct. Okay. Right, right, at this oral argument. This and you, you did not object to the calculation of the base offense level at the second sentencing? Well, <clears throat> that's what I initially argued in the opening brief. Uh, I apologize. I continued to look at it over the weekend as I was preparing for this oral argument. 
And when I was looking at the uh, sentencing transcripts uh, further, I, I did find some language that could be interpreted as an objection. Uh, for instance, at the uh, first sentencing, defense counsel argued that his client didn't have to threaten anybody to engage in this occupation. That's at record, record on Appeal 536. And then also at the first sentencing, uh, defense counsel said he's not guilty of these enhancements that they're trying to enforce on the base offense level. That's at ROA 540. And then at the first sentencing hearing, the defense attorney from the Federal Defender's Office said he's in fact not guilty of these accusations that are being used to enhance the base guideline level, ROA 541. So I would urge the court to consider those as objections. I wasn't there at the sentencing, and so I don't understand exactly the behind the scenes of how this was operating. But I would argue that even though the district court and the government weren't talking about this uh, four-level enhancement for fraud or coercion, that these statements made by the uh, uh, defense counsel, by the federal defender of the sentencing, would actually qualify as uh, objections to preserve error. Also, at the second hearing, the second sentencing hearing, the Federal Defender's Office attorney said, I would like the court to recognize that this was an adult female who came down from Iowa to Texas to engage in prostitution with my client, Jonathan Avery. Again, and that's at ROA 197. I would argue that those qualify as objections sufficient to preserve error in this case uh, for the uh, um, for all three points that were raised in Mr. Avery's appellate brief. One of the things that I would also like to point out that I think is very significant is that during the second sentencing hearing, the district court said that uh, uh, the victim's prostitution became unwilling quote unquote, became unwilling, even if it was willing at the beginning. So in other words, even the district court is recognizing that there's a time difference between the fraud and coercion and the underlying, convince, uh, underlying offense in this case. I'd like to switch gears now. 2242, it's, correct me, it's a scheme offense though, right? Not a scheme. It's, uh, it's persuading a victim to travel in interstate commerce to engage. And the indictment said what? On or about just a single day mm -hmm. or not? Yes or it no? Did, it, it said on or about the day, the day that was identified was the day that uh, uh, the victim dialed 911 to contact the police. In, okay, so that's Washington. well after. That's correct. The movement. That's correct. Because she had been there for two weeks. Right. But so if you're arguing that we have to freeze frame to assess coercion at the point of enticement. The indictment is actually identifying a later date. I'm just, I'm just thinking aloud. It, it, it is. It's identifying a later date, but it's got the qualification of on or about. I know, but, but my point is, it sounds like what you're arguing is a variance argument, that, that, that the guilty plea here and the factual basis and the sentencing all corresponded to something later than what was charged. But, but you pled to it, the on or about later date, Anyway, um, move on. You move on to your second I, I, argument or third or what? Yeah, the second argument uh, <clears throat> is in connection with the second issue that was raised in Mr. Avery's uh, appellate brief. It's about the lack of notice in this case, uh, which didn't comply with either the federal rules of criminal procedure or the sentencing. This is guidance. notice of the enhancement. That's correct, Your Honor. But I thought the law was that you only have to know the facts. Understood, understood. But here, there weren't facts that would have put Mr. Avery on notice. The um, understood, yeah. In Garcia, it does talk about how if they have actual knowledge of the uh, the facts, that's enough to put them on notice because a defense attorney uh, should have be aware of what the sentencing guidelines could, the consequences of it. Um, But I think it's very important to point out 
that in a statement that the victim made to Detective Sergeant Joel Gordon, she said that when she first arrived in Houston on March 10th, 2022, she learned that she would have to act as a prostitute and was advised, and advised she was originally okay with it because she had been a sex worker in the past. There's just no indication of coercion to have her come down from Iowa to Houston to engage in this activity. The, uh, I mean, the PSR describes threats and sexual assault. That is correct. And though, but those occurred. All, this all comes down to chronology, though. Right, that's correct. I, okay, I thought when you're talking about Garcia, you were saying your client wasn't even present when the enhancement that ends up in the JNC appears. You're not making that argument, the process argument. No, I am making the process argument that... Uh, and I, how do you get around Judge Smith asked about Garcia? In your reply brief, you cite CF Vega, but in Vega, that's a supervised release condition and the court ends up affirming. Mm -hmm. So what's your authority that there was not sufficient notice of the enhancement case authority? The, well, the, ca the case of... Th the, uh, I'm actually more relying on the chronology, as he suggested. That's what I thought. Okay. I, I'm relying on the chronology because um, there's a lot of documentation about Instagram messages back and forth between the uh, uh, victim and Avery. And the uh, Instagram messages make it clear that the victim voluntarily came down to Houston initially. The Instagram mess, for instance here, I'll give you some quotes from the Instagram messages. Uh, Avery's talking about that, uh, about her working at a, a club, and that's at ROA 281. And then Avery says that would also include quote unquote tricks. That's at ROA 281. Uh, the victim responds, because it seemed you got to make it on a corner. That's at ROA 281. And then she further says, and I'm not built for that. That's at ROA 281. Avery responds, no, the corner is the worst way to chase a bag out here. That's ROA 281. Chasing a bag out here, by the way, means a way to make money. So they're talking very practically about why she would be coming down to Houston. And there's no coercion in this exchange. In fact, even as recognized in the uh, PSR, um, they talked about how the word P stands for pimp. And they were talking about this very candidly. Again, in these Instagram messages, there's no evidence of any coercion with her coming down to Houston. The, going back to the chronology, because as uh, Judge Higginson uh, pointed out, the chronology is crucial in this case. Uh, the texts show that the, uh, uh, the, by the way, these Instagram conversations took place on March 8, 2002. She arrived in Houston about two days later on March 10th. Uh, apparently, she was operating pursuant to their agreement for about a week. And then after a week, everything changed. Uh, there was a big shift. But by that time, that crime that uh, Avery pleaded guilty to had already been completed. And so you have a, a new development in this relationship where Avery may have been acting coercively. Where, was, where is it in the record that uh, you objected to any kind of finding of coercion? The, uh, well, for instance, at the first sentencing hearing, when, when the federal defender said my client didn't have to threaten anybody to engage in this occupation, and, uh, and when the federal defender says he's not guilty of these enhancement that they're trying to enforce on the base offense level, that's at ROA 540. And where he says uh, 
he's in fact not guilty of these accusations that are being used to enhance the base guideline level. And that's at ROA 541. Again, I apologize I didn't make that crystal clear in the opening brief or the reply brief. It, this is just a very unusual fact pattern. I, I've never seen one like this before where there's four points applied and nobody addresses it at all. And I didn't even discover its existence until I looked at the statement of reasons and I saw that that's apparently was the basis for this enhancement. I see that my time has run out unless the court has. You saved time for a bottle. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Reed. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. John Reed on behalf of the United States. Uh, Your Honors, I was prepared to talk at length about the alleged lack of notice and um, factual findings here and the uh, offense level of 15, but I'm hearing for the first time uh, Mr. Ebaugh's argument that he now says that the objection, uh, there, was, there was a preservation of the objection to the 15 level uh, enhancement. He says that there, uh, there was no finding of fraud in relation to the elements of this offense. These are arguments that are being made for the first time before this court. They are not in his brief. Um, it's, 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 it's pretty well established this court does not consider arguments raised for the first time in oral argument. None of the factual citations that he just gave you are in his brief uh, either. And, and we, we do understand so, that because we run across okay. that all the, all the time. But, 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 but assuming uh, I mean, we're, we're here, so why don't you go ahead and, and, and respond. And we, of course, will take into account whether it was timely raised. I, w I will do my best, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Avery's conviction should be affirmed because he, he has not shown reversible error in connection with either the calculation of the offense level or the guideline range. Uh, the discussions during both sentencing hearings here were, were centered around or cabined by the PSR's calculations under the cross-reference uh, in relation to how Mr. Avery pleaded guilty. And I think, Judge Higginson, you sort of outlined that at the beginning of the argument exactly as I was going to, and that is, uh, the cross-reference here is to the sexual abuse statutes, which triggers the sexual abuse guideline, right? Mr. Avery's main argument was he didn't plead guilty to an offense involving sexual abuse because he didn't admit to using force or uh, threats of physical force against his victim. That was always his argument, and he wanted to avoid a significant increase in the uh, base offense level, which was 30 with an uh, associated four level specific offense characteristic for sexual abuse under 2A 3.1. And as Judge Higginson noted, Judge Rosenthal, a very capable uh, and conscientious district judge, thought that by uh, entering his guilty plea, he may have waived the argument that he was making. And so she wanted to consult the rearrangement transcripts to see exactly how he had pleaded guilty. Mm -hmm. Turns out it was true. He didn't, during rearrangement, admit to using force. He says, oh, I enticed her. I persuaded her. I, I didn't use force. I didn't force anybody to be a prostitute. And actually, at first, he denied even knowing she was going to be a prostitute. And then he came around and admitted that. Um, but the fact is, he didn't admit specifically to force. And so Judge Rosenthal said, OK, well, I'm not going to apply the guideline range. And uh, or, excuse me, I'm not going to apply the cross-reference in subsection C. Um, so she took that off the table. But by doing so, she stayed within the, the guideline for the offense of conviction, which was 2G 1.1. That left subsection A for the base offense level, subsection B for the separate specific offense characteristic for coercion or fraud, which is separately defined. I guess, I mean, w what he did extensively brief is <coughs> in all that very sedulous, okay, let's make sure it's not a cross-reference under C. Yes. What never happened at the second sentencing is, but there's still a subsection B enhancement for the same levels. No, it's not the same levels. Well, four levels up, right? Four levels okay. up. Okay, so my point is, 
when, when Judge Rosenthal says, mm-hmm. and correct me if I'm wrong, at the second sentencing, I won't apply an enhancement or cost reference for physical force. It, that sounds like she's not going to apply C or B. She never says, oh, but I, I'm not going to do C as I thought I might under the guilty plea. But, counsel, you should be prepared and know now you're still going to get four levels because of subsection B. That's never clarified. She, she didn't state that specifically. You're right. But the sentence that you just read is, if I follow what he pleaded guilty to, then I would not apply the enhancements or cross-reference for coercion and physical force. Mm-hmm. You read that correctly, Your Honor. What were they talking about at that point? The increased base offense level of 30 and the additional four-level uh, specific offense characteristic under the sexual abuse And I think, guideline. like you, it sounds like today they aren't pressing notice. They're accepting Garcia, just as Judge Smith described it, which is you're on notice if the guidelines put you, so it's all about facts. Right. So, so now let's shift to his chronology fact point. Right. Okay. So what in the PSR described coercion connected to the enticement, not the sort of deteriorating later relationship? Okay, so he hasn't, first of all, he hasn't cited any authority that the uh, coercion has to be specifically tied to the elements of the offense, the coercion and enticement. The guideline reads that the offense, uh, the enhancement applies if the offense involves coercion or fraud, right? And I think the use of the word evolves, involves, excuse me, is very specific on the part of the Sentencing Commission. And normally we look at involves as something much broader than necessarily the elements. So in other words, the elements here are, sure, persuade, entice to travel in interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. And then once she got here, she was forced to do other things, regardless of if, if she thought she was going to be a prostitute once she arrived in Houston. She didn't want to do that anymore, but she had to keep doing it. And she was so fearful, she called 911. Though, but when he, when he read the Instagram, and admittedly, this is pretty far away from what I thought the briefs were saying, but it, she does at some point, it sounds like, say, I'm not built for that. So are you, are you, a, are you a conceding that there was no. a... No, I'm not, I'm not conceding anything, Your Honor, because the, where she says she's not built for that, I think that's pretty... It's one way of reading it. But I think it's ambiguous. I don't think that's the only way. She may have thought she was going to get involved in, you know, something once she got to Houston. But she didn't know the extent, right, of how she would be forced to have sex with up to five men a day, right, give all of her money to uh, Mr. Avery, also known as Drippy, um, and, you know, who was a member of a gang that she feared and who was known for prostituting, you know, young women. And in girls. a guilty plea, we're just usually looking at the PSR. What is the fact statement in the PSR that describes violence connected to the 2242 offense? Do you know it off the top of your head? Uh, the, yeah, well, so... Why did the P probation office say this sure. involved physical Well, abuse? yes, and so the probation office took it to the next level, right, as being sexual abuse under the sexual... That's abuse. all they did? They went down subsection C, they never came back to B? Correct. Oh, I see. They, the probation office only applied the subsection C, and that's why I say that's what they were always talking about, was subsection C. Uh, it's paragraphs 11 and 12 where the um, probation officer goes through... The, uh, the threats that were made to uh, the victim. And they uh, all do post-date arrival in Houston? Yes, yes. There, she arrived here in Houston, and, and I think it's paragraph 12. She said she wanted to leave the residence, and uh, he threatened to kill her. And he sent a text message that said, you know, people will die if they ever get goofy, and you will too. And, and that's what the probation office was looking at. Nowhere right? in the sentencing in front of Judge Rosenthal did the defense attorney then say, Your Honor, we admit there's tons of force, but it wasn't chronologically in time. And, and related to that, you heard me asking about the honor about language. Right. When was this crime that he pled to? When did he plead that, it, that the date that it occurred? I, I, I'm going to be honest, I don't recall what the exact language of the information. He was originally indicted for sex trafficking, allowed to plead guilty to an information, and I was not prepared to address that 
specific question. Uh, but in the sentencing transcript, is there ever an objection? Your Honor, we admit there was coercion and physical force, but it was after the completion of the offense. Did no, that he, objection ever get? No, he never there? says that. He maintained all along that there was no coercion and no force and at all. At all. Yeah, that was that was just straight up. There was no coercion, right? Um, now, I think you know that argument does apply to both subsections. Uh, you know, you, you could make that argument. But what happened was the district court, okay, takes the subsection C cross-reference out. I'm not going to apply the sexual abuse guidelines, right? So that meant she was staying within uh, the guideline for the offense of conviction, again, 2G 1.1. And she says, after this uh, announcement that, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to apply it, your offense level is 15. Your guideline range is 41 to 51 months. There's only one way that the district court could have arrived at an offense level of 15 and a guideline range of 41 to 51 months, and that's by applying the subsection B four-level enhancement. That seems conclusive of notice under our law, but, but then we're in this world of is there actually a preponderance of evidence to support? And he hasn't, my position is he hasn't argued that the subsection B doesn't apply. That is not in his brief. He argues there were no findings, and he argues that there was no notice. He never says that the district court incorrectly applied it. He says she didn't apply it in the procedurally proper manner with notice and, and findings. Did the government make that recommendation to Judge Rosenthal? No, but they didn't have to. Uh, Angeles Mendoza, which is a case cited in uh, the reply brief says that the district court could sua sponte apply upward enhancements even, uh, even where the defendant had no explicit knowledge of the possibility of them as long as the defendant was aware of the facts supporting the, the enhancement. And the facts, um, Judge Higginson, are those that are in the PSR. The court adopted the PSR, but she also found um, Mr. Avery's conduct to be, okay, sinister, exploitation of the worst kind, coerced prostitution, uh, trafficking in women. Just that as- That amalgam. I'm sorry? You're saying that amalgam is a district court finding. Yes, you may infer that that's the finding of coercion because we don't, we don't equate trafficking in women uh, with voluntary uh, 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 conduct. Right, we don't say that uh, they were they were trafficked uh, and they were exploited. You don't exploit someone who's voluntarily participating. Yeah, okay. just just as a you know a general matter, right? That's so that that's that's my argument there. And so she adopted the PSR. She she made these findings about the conduct. She specifically said at the first sentencing hearing, this is coerced prostitution. She said that. Now, she, she backed off the application of the cross-reference, but she never said that means there's no, no enhancements. And, and again, she just stayed within the 2G 1.1. Essentially, she gave him a huge uh, reduction, and this was to his benefit, uh, you know, by going down from a range of 188 to 235 months, what became 41 to 51 months. Now, he argued for an offense level of 11. So he knew, and that would have been a 14 level enhancement with a three level reduction for acceptance, and he argued that it should have been 11, right? He knew he wasn't getting that because she said, no, your, your offense level is 15 and your range is 41 to 51. He never said, I, I know Mr. Ebal has, has argued that he objected to that or, or there are statements to that effect, but in actuality what he did was he argued for a sentence within that range, the 41 to 51 month range. He argued that a sentence within the guidelines that Your Honor just announced would be sufficient punishment. So what do you do with that? What do I do with that? I, I look at that as saying, well, it's plain error review at, at best here. Um, he has not argued, and just getting back to the notice a little bit, uh, in my view, he has not argued that the subsection B was inapplicable or didn't fit the conduct described. He has not argued that uh, a more specific notice uh, would have changed how he objected. 
and would have mattered. And in United States versus Stanford, uh, this court said that uh, where the defendant didn't indicate how he would have objected with greater notice, that supported a harmlessness finding, even if there were, you know, there were some error notice, right? Um, I have a, I have a, if there are no further questions on that, I just, I just have a backup argument that assuming, even assuming the court were to find some type of procedural error here, uh, the government's view is that it would be either, uh, either have no effect on Mr. Avery's substantial rights under plain error review, or, or it would be harmless even if you held the government to the burden, uh, because the district court did vary upward from the 41 to 51 months uh, based on the 3553A factors. She specifically you know, commented on, again, the sinister nature. So that's the nature and circumstances of the conduct, right? Um, his criminal history, which was a six despite his young, relatively young age, uh, his membership in a, in a gang, Judge Rosenthal noted that and the details of his uh, history. Uh, the fact that she chose 72 months, uh, flat six years, was not a multiple or derivative of any of the guideline numbers. And in fact, she said that the facts here could have supported a much harsher sentence, but I reluctantly, quote, reluctantly find this is sufficient but not greater than necessary. And that seems to be a pretty plain indication that there was no, no number below that that was going to uh, satisfy the sentencing goals. Um, and then finally, you know, uh, in Sanchez Hernandez, this court said when addressing substantial rights and harmlessness, it looks at what was driving this court, this judge, to impose this sentence on this defendant. And here, uh, Judge Rosenthal, at the conclusion, admonished Mr. Avery. She said, you have, quote, earned this sentence, and it is this court's judgment. Uh, so again, I, I believe that qualifies uh, as, as harmlessness or at least no showing of an effect on his substantial rights, depending on the, the standard of review. Uh, I think that's all I have, unless there are any further questions. The government asked that uh, this court affirm. All right, thank you, Mr. Reed. Thank you. Ebo for rebuttal. Again, I've never seen a fact pattern like this before. Very unusual. Uh, when I first saw that four points, the enhancement of four was made, I thought that maybe the judge had gotten confused and originally took away the base offense level of 30, but forgot to take away that... Uh, enhancement for C, which was also a four-point enhancement, and that maybe, I don't know, the probation officer decided to put in the B enhancement in the statement of reasons. I don't know. Uh, regardless of whether facts are confusing or not, the briefs can't be. Right. So, so your argument in your principal brief did or didn't assert and point to an objection at sentencing that, oh, this is a fact objection. There was coercion. My argument is there was coercion, but it didn't attach to the time of the offense. Did you, did your predecessor counsel make that argument in sentencing? And do you even make it in your principal brief? He didn't make it at sentencing, but I would argue that uh, Judge Rosenthal, sui sponte, said that it would, she would not apply the enhancements or cross-reference for coercion, and that that is enough to preserve error. The fact that she wouldn't apply I, I the enhancements, see, I could plural. see that being enough to say, therefore, she told us there wouldn't be an enhancement, so therefore, I didn't have noticed there would be. And that's pretty much what I thought your brief said. Yes. But as I heard your principal argument now, you're not saying there's a lack of notice. You're just saying there isn't a preponderance of evidence to support coercion at the time of incitement. I apologize if... I made any confusion. I'm still standing by my position that uh, there was an adequate notice. Ah, and how do you get around Garcia? Well, <clears throat> because there were no facts that would have brought to his attention that B applied. The reason that there weren't any facts is, like I explained before, the chronology makes it apparent that the, it was entirely voluntary when the victim came down to Houston. And if he didn't the, the coercive 
the arguably coercive actions took place a week or later after she came down to Houston. She traveled to Houston. And for that reason, they're not tied adequately to the underlying 24-22 offense. I think it's also very significant that uh, the PSR never mentioned uh, subsection B of section 2G 1.1 as a possible, possible enhancement. Uh, that omission speaks volumes. And of course, as explained in the opening brief, the fact the court never mentioned it at the hearing, I, th I think there's a real problem with this. We can't go forward in the future applying enhancements if the defendant has no awareness of the enhancement possibly applying or even an awareness that there's allegedly facts that would make it applicable. And again, like I said, there's no- The hearing was good. You did object to the PSR. Judge Rosenthal paused. You filed the motion to withdraw. And then she said, you're right about all that. So the subsection she cross-referenced, she corrects mm -hmm. based on a good defense attorney work. Mm -hmm. But defense attorney still has to be aware of the full set of guidelines. And then the range is described, which could only correspond to the subsection B cross-reference. So then what's the objection at the time? Again, the uh, no there's no explicit objection. Uh, again, we're relying on the case law of this court that a, a district court judge, sui sponte, raising the issue that there's no enhancements that are going to be applied, that's enough to preserve error. The one final point that I wanted to make is that uh, the government said that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision of United States Burns uh, was uh, said that United States, Ver United States versus Burns was uh, overruled, although this court did say that in a footnote, uh, Mr. Avery would argue that that was just dicta and that uh, although it was abrogated by uh, uh, Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 32H and uh, the sentencing, another portion of the sentencing guidelines, that uh, the Burns rule is still applicable. Thank you, Your Honor. If you, unless you have any questions, I'll sit down. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Ebal. Your case is under submission, and we notice that you're court appointed. We thank you for your work on behalf of your client and your willingness to take the appointment. Next case. Miller versus